Dr. Simpson is a professor of medicine and interim division director, medical director of multiple ICUs, division of pulmonary and critical care at the University of Kansas Medical Center, and his talk today is When Good Sepsis Care Goes Bad. Let's welcome Dr. Simpson. <laughs> Always makes you a little nervous when people clap at the front because you hope they still feel like that at the end, right? So a couple of housekeeping details. One thing I, I want to say, I hope you'll all forgive me the hiking boots. Uh, I tore an Achilles tendon earlier this year and I am still was in a boot for two months. And now I have to wear these things every day for a while until the pain completely resides. So no disrespect meant by hiking boots at your, at your grand rounds, but uh, um, that's the way it's got to be. Also, this is, uh, you guys are sort of my guinea pigs, if you will. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to do exactly this sort of thing. I've given a lot of introductory talks, getting people sepsis um, initiatives up and running, and I've done repeat visits at places, but they specifically asked me this time, would I focus on, on we can't get our core measures met, what are some of the problems with that? How can you help us with that? How can you inform us with that? And so, so that's what this talk is about. Um, so we'll just launch right into it. So our goals are, we're, we're going to start, I know you all know sepsis, but we're going to review it anyway because you can't go over it too much. So we're going to do that a bit and we'll try and be quick about that part. Um, what are our, how do we diagnose it? What are our treatment recommendations? What the CMS core measures are? And then we're going to review some areas where those can go wrong and uh, both at the provider level and at the system level and uh, have some ideas about how we can approach those areas where that goes off the rails. Now what they told me is they said, they said, um, wasn't you guys, uh, this was via probably third order communication that you guys might be 60 percent compliant with CMS measures and I can tell you if you are that compliant you are in the elite of the nation. Uh, most of the nation is no better than 40 percent compliant uh, with CMS measures so so if you're doing that well you're doing really really well but still 60 percent not what we're used to. As doctors, we're used to being above 90% at least, right? So, so we have to go through all this stuff. So what is sepsis? Just to remind ourselves, there is a new definition, which I do endorse, by the way. I think the definition as a concise definition is really nice. Life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated host response to infection encapsulates it very nicely. What you want to remember is the key operational factors there are infection and organ dysfunction. I would challenge any of us to know exactly when things are becoming dysregulated and it's a nice notion, it's just not very operationable. Is that a word? <laughs> operationable? It's not very practical. We don't understand when dysfunction has happened. I want to remind you that sepsis not only kills people in the hospital, and we all know that the mortality rate ranges depending on the severity of the illness from 15 to 50 percent, um, and that still is true. The initial CMS data, which they have not actually published anywhere, but which I happen to have friends at CMS, uh, shows that uh, the mortality rate overall in America following our CMS measures is 40% for severe sepsis and septic shock. So we are still not very good at it. We also know that really good places have septic shock mortality down in the 15 to 17% range and severe sepsis mortalities well below 10%. So, so uh, but as a nation, 
on average, we're still not that good at it. On top of that, what this slide's here to say is this is when you get out of the hospital, this is the ensuing two years. It still kills you for at least two years and upwards. That episode of sepsis sets you up for further episodes of sepsis, sets you up for, believe it or not, acute myocardial infarction, sets you up for stroke, and a whole myriad of other problems that people have. So, so having sepsis is a gift that keeps on giving. Um, this is another thing that it does that I really fear, actually, as a person who uses my brain for a living. Uh, this is a study that I won't go into a lot of detail, but the key thing is this is where an episode of sepsis occurs. These patients had a much higher incidence or a much higher prevalence of moderate to severe cognitive dysfunction, uh, with that prevalence being about 17%. In this population, this is all people age 55 and up that were in this study, but nonetheless, I'm 55 and up, and I would not want this to happen to me. Also to remember that the incidence of sepsis goes up with aging, as shown here on this line. You hit age 65 and the incidence takes off really much like a rocket, um, and our population is aging. Uh, as of 2011, uh, baby boomers turn 65 at the rate of 10,000 a day, and that's going to continue for a total of 19 years. That's going to be 39 million people who age up, oops, age up into this age range right here, and that's happening all the time, and doggone it, it keeps happening to me. I just turned 60 this year, and you know, inevitably it just keeps going, which as we all say is better than the alternative, I suppose. Now let's review our definitions of sepsis. And why am I stuck on this definition of sepsis? <coughs> is because two reasons. One, see, um, well no, multiple reasons, but two important ones that impact all of us in the United States of America. One is that CMS measures, your core measures, are still based on this definition. Okay, so if we want to be uh, compliant and if we want to uh, demonstrate how good we are at sepsis, we have to still be using this definition. Two is ICD-10 co ICD coding. Um, those of you residents, you don't know this yet because you don't have to do the coding, but all the rest of us who have to submit a bill for our uh, services and the hospital who submits a bill for its services use ICD-10 coding and ICD-10 has not changed to accommodate the proposed new definition. So we are still um, in this realm of sepsis definitions. Now remember, all sepsis begins with infection. Without infection, you don't have sepsis. You may have pancreatitis, you may have something else that mimics sepsis, but without infection, you don't have it. And what is infection? Uh, according to our 1992 definition, by the way, this has worked very nicely for 25 years and there's not really a good reason to abandon this. Um, but inflammatory response to microorganisms or invasion of normally sterile tissues. Now remember, when we are trying to diagnose sepsis, we are not going to wait for the cultures to be back. So we say suspected infection. But what we mean indeed is suspected infection, uh, not they have SIRS, so now I have to suspect infection. So. And you can see how you could go around in circles if that's the way you're looking. What we mean is somebody who's got pleuritic chest pain, purulent sputum, consolidation on physical exam. That's a suspected pneumonia. It's a darn near proven pneumonia, but just not quite. Uh, you certainly wouldn't hold antibiotics in someone uh, who was looking sick with those symptoms, right? Or someone with cellulitis or someone with uh, with uh, uh, costophrenic angle um, tenderness. You just wouldn't do that. Those are syndromes that should make you suspect an infection. So what we're looking for is suspected infection along with SIRS, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which we will review. We say that you have sepsis if you have infection with SIRS. We say you have severe sepsis if you have sepsis with organ dysfunction. And we say that you have septic shock if you have sepsis with hypotension despite fluid uh, administration, adequate volume administration, 
Okay? So I hope we're running through this fast enough. One thing I want everyone to remember is the absence of SIRS does not mean the absence of severe sepsis or septic shock. Uh, about 12% of people who have severe sepsis or septic shock will not have <laughs> SIRS because they can't. Elderly people have a hard time getting a fever. They may be on a beta blocker at the same time, so they have a hard time getting tachycardic. Um, oops, we haven't even reviewed what the SERS criteria are, but you understand, I think, what I'm getting at because you guys do have an active sepsis program. Um, we have never said that you don't have severe sepsis because of the absence of SIRS. And, and I'm pretty good friends with some of the guys who were in the initial sepsis consensus conference, and they will tell you, and in fact they have written since the new definition came out, that, that uh, they put SIRS in there because they don't want people missing and they want people detecting early. They didn't want to wait until it's severe organ dysfunction or multiple organ dysfunction or shock before they detect sepsis. So here's our SIRS criteria, just to remember, again our baseline, temperature greater than 38 or less than 36, and I forgot, are you guys on Celsius or Fahrenheit? So it's greater than 100.3 or less than 96.8 if you're on Fahrenheit. Heart rate greater than 90, respiratory rate greater than 20, white count more than 12, less than 4, or 10% bands. Okay, and I think you guys probably have this all memorized. We're just reviewing to say this is our baseline. This is what we're talking about. Again, your organ dysfunctions, starting from head to toe, altered mental status, hypotension, even if it does respond to fluids, and there are your definitions, hypoxemia, oliguria or anuria, or a bump in serum creatinine, fairly minor bump, by the way, uh, bilirubin greater than four, thrombocytopenia or uh, increased INR or increased D-dimer or all three as evidence of disseminated intravascular coagulation, and then lactic acidosis or increased serum lactate. Uh, so we say any of these are the organ dysfunctions that we were mentioning before in that slide, okay? Any questions about that? Probably not, I hope not. So, what do we do about sepsis? Our best guide is the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, uh, and we'll go into some more of this uh, in just a little bit later in the talk, but uh, we have new ones out as of February of this year. I hope you've all been able to see those. Um, there are some minor changes in those, but the key things to remember are that severe sepsis is an emergency. Sepsis is an emergency. Septic shock is an emergency. It needs to be treated as an emergency because we have a fair amount of emerging data that the earlier you treat, the better people survive. So that's very important. Surviving sepsis campaign bundles from the 2012 edition are what our CMS core measures are mainly based on. So that's why I have left these two bundles. As a matter of fact, in 2017, we left the three-hour bundle the same. There's no change to that. There are some changes in the six-hour approach. Um, but you all know we measure a lactate, we get blood cultures, we give broad spectrum antibiotics as soon as we can get them in. We administer 30 mLs uh, per kilogram of crystalloid for either a lactate greater than four or for uh, unresponsive, uh, or for hypotension, I should say. Um, and again, those have not changed. Certainly, CMS measure, which is exactly this, has not changed. To be completed within six hours, we have that we want to apply vasopressors. I bet there's a mouse here, isn't there? Yeah, we'll apply vasopressors. <coughs> um, if they don't uh, respond to our initial fluid, fluid bolus, we are shooting for an arterial pressure of 65. Um, we also then at that point, this is the 2012 guidelines, still recommended, measure a central venous pressure, measure a central venous oxygen saturation, and re-measure the lactate if the lactate was elevated. 
Okay? And it was from these, as I say, that the CMS core measures were taken. Now why are the core measures important to us as doctors uh, and to the hospital as a hospital? Uh, as so far there's nothing punitive about core measures, but there are a couple of things. Number one, they are publicly reported. So you're going to stick your numbers whether you like it or not, you're not going to stick them out there. CMS is going to stick them out there and they're going to say this is where Freeman Health stands uh, in terms of their ability to take care of a septic patient, along with pneumonia, along with congestive heart failure, along with acute MI, uh, along with stroke. Um, so all of these core measures are publicly available for people to see how we're doing. So that's one thing. So if you don't want to look bad, you want to do well on these. Secondly, you have to remember why the core measures were put in place. At the time the core measures went in place, most hospitals in America were doing nothing in particular about sepsis. Okay? And this is why I, for one, endorse the notion of a core measure. Now, Lots of people rail against the core measure because they go, well, this is a cookbook and it may not apply to everyone. And I go, that's just fine. But before the core measure, 90% of people in America were not getting any particular approach at all. So now at least we're pushing the bulk of us in the right direction and that's an appropriate thing to do. So what are the core measures? If you look, you can see uh, the three hour bundle is exactly the same. Um, no differences at all from the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. You might note though, I didn't say surviving sepsis does recommend that we get antibiotics in within an hour. So we should always still be striving to do that. Um, then they've added a few things. So they initially came out looking pretty much just like the surviving sepsis guidelines. <laughs> There were some objections from the medical community and so they put back in something that actually uh, I like it in two different ways and that's the reassessment of volume status and tissue perfusion by the physician. Um, I like it for a couple of reasons and let's stop and think about it. Who are these people? These are people in septic shock in an ICU. Just stop and ask yourself if I were in an ICU or if my mom were in the ICU wouldn't I kind of want the doctor to come back and see how I'm doing? And yeah, the answer is of course yes. And the answer also is of course if you've got a patient in shock, you do go back and see how they're doing. The core measure just says document it. Tell us what you saw and look specifically at cardiovascular function, hypotension, tissue perfusion, and write that down. Actually, as of January, I forget whether it's 2017 or 2016, but one of these Januaries, they took away the requirement for the detailed documentation. You just have to say, I came back and assessed the patient's volume status and tissue perfusion, and I think they are what you think. Simple little note like that is what it takes to meet the core measure. Uh, but I, I like that. When I first saw this, I thought, oh man, there's no way that most docs are going to come back if they admit somebody at 5 or 6 at night. They're not going to come back at 10 o'clock to see the patient. And I was happy because I thought that would push them to use some more objective measure. And, and I think if it does that, that's also great. You know, if that's the way it works, that's just fine. So those measures are CVP, bedside cardiovascular ultrasound, central venous O2 saturation, or some dynamic measure of volume responsiveness. Um, I didn't put any more about that in this talk, uh, but there are some good measures, dynamic measures of volume responsiveness that can be used to very good effect. Um, and I probably should have put them in the talk, but I just didn't. Um, so these are our CMS measures. On our CS, uh, CMS bundle completion, unless we do all of it, so in a severe sepsis patient, the three hour bundle, in a septic shock patient, the three and the six hour bundle, unless we do it all, or every component, we don't get credit for it, okay? And that's why so many hospitals, including my own, uh, are not necessarily that compliant, because it's 
not necessarily easy to do that. So the remainder of the talk, oh, well, one more slide. So who is it that qualifies and who is it that we look at and who is it we have to report on these things? Anybody who's 18 or over whose final coding shows sepsis, severe sepsis or septic shock? So that means you gotta be looking everywhere, not just the emergency department, but everywhere in the house and surveillance is everyone's job, but that's basically it. We survey everyone that has this. So the simple answer is just don't diagnose anyone with sepsis, then you don't have to report anyone, right? I think that would be, unfortunately some folks, some folks have seriously considered gaming the system that way. Okay. So we're gonna talk about where we go off the rails and where we have problems with, uh, with meeting our goals here. Um, and so I, I, we're gonna start with, with uh, provider-related issues, so that's why I called us clowns, I guess, when clowns go bad. So now you would think that sepsis care would be fairly simple. <laughs> People present with symptoms, we send some labs, we do a physical exam, we make a diagnosis and we treat. This is the way that we all think it goes. This is, I can assure you, the way that the public thinks it goes. But in point of fact, there are some bottlenecks or choke points. I almost wrote choke points in here because I thought given the deadly nature of sepsis, choke point might be a more apt term, but then it seemed a little too a little too much, so I decided not to put it in writing, at least. Um, so patients present with a certain set of signs and symptoms, uh, exam findings, and the labs that we choose to send from that, that it takes to make a diagnosis of sepsis. And there are a number of different ways this can go wrong. The first of which, of course, is that we haven't been taught to recognize. Now, I'm hoping that around the nation, a lot more people are being taught to recognize. And I know that here, you guys have all spent a lot of time learning the stuff that we just talked about there. So recognition, I hope, is better. But let me show you the state of the art in America, certainly before CMS measures. Now, this is a quote from a political writer, Niccolo Machiavelli. So you go, what the heck does he know about medicine? Well, what he knows is what the doctors told him, which is this, that in hectic fever, they didn't have that word sepsis at the time, in the beginning, it's easy to cure, but difficult to detect. But if you wait a while, uh, having neither detected nor treated it, it becomes easy to detect but difficult to treat. Before our CMS measures, for sure, this was the state of the art in the United States of America. This is the state of the art around the world. As, unless you specifically go out of your way to learn to recognize this deadly illness that kills as many people as we said, um, this is exactly the circumstance in which you remain. I can't tell you, I've been on the road, if you will, for many years training various different hospitals about this. And you guys were all fairly enlightened when I was here, what, two years ago, something? Uh, you were pretty enlightened on this already when I came to talk to you, but there are plenty of places where I can still go today where someone will jump up when I show those criteria and go, you are all wrong, you know? Sepsis is when you have to use Levofed and when they won't respond to fluids and you're just completely changing everything with what you're telling us. And so that still exists in the United States of America and until that doesn't exist, we have problems. I think you guys are beyond that level here. Um, the next thing is, what can a provider do? They can value their own decision-making autonomy above, above the overall benefit of using a protocol. This happens all the time. Or they can be resistant to picking up on the new information or the information that's not what they learned <coughs> in medical school or residency. And 
And I don't know how much this applies here. You all have to ask yourselves, but this is a common thing that I hear. Well, I was brought up to believe that medicine is an art as well as a science. Probably all of you were taught that in medical school as well. And we get sort of hung up on that in certain places. And so, so my reply to that, and I've been told that many times during my career, because I'm, I'm actually fairly large on using protocols as a group, an entire hospital choosing to approach a set of patients in a uniform way. But I've been taught, that, uh, told, medicine's an art and or you know, I want to make a different decision in every patient because that's the way I want to do it and I think that's what's better. And so this is, oh, these slides, I bet they run through too fast. Yes, they do. Let me try that again. Here's some fine artwork, okay? I think everyone recognizes this as fine artwork from the, I don't know, 15th century, 16th century. Rubens, uh, a painting there, and it happens to be medically related. You can see they're doing a dissection here. Not too many people would argue with that as fine artwork. That's also, we got a, man, it's not gonna work for me here. Uh, I found that this morning and I forgot my uh, paintings are going through too fast, but I think you get the point. That's also considered fine art. That's also considered fine art. That, of course, is Picasso. That is Jackson Pollock. All fine artists, all getting different results. One problem in medicine, we're not allowed to get different results. We're all shooting for the same result. The least injury to our patients, that they all survive, that they go home and get back to what they're supposed to be doing. Us practicing art doesn't necessarily achieve the same outcome which is why it's useful to have standardized procedures and protocols. <clears throat> Another thing that providers can do is look at data and believe that their own interpretation of the data is better than the guidelines committee's interpretation of the data. And I would suggest that that is a dangerous position to be in. We'll talk about why in just a moment. And then the other thing that's easy is if you like to be an early adopter, sometimes you jump on the bandwagon before things are proven, when it may not be the right time to do that, um, and you disrupt, you disrupt your overall hospital and your group's approach. Okay, so let's go back to guidelines committee because I want to want to uh, emphasize that a bit. My approach to when and how to use a guideline is I always pay attention to them, always. And I always did before because I had this philosophy, but now I am a member of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines Writing Committee, and I know just how deeply intense the work is, and I know how carefully we take it. So we look at every single paper, and that's what the purpose of the next slide is. We look at every single paper that's been written since the last guideline came out, and we analyze it to determine how good is the paper, how strong is the evidence, how strong should we make the recommendation based on this evidence, and it's a panel of, I think there were about 50 of us the last time, on the panel, at least 30 of us, I, I don't know, I didn't ever bother to count, a big room full of people. Uh, all of us had our own sub area to look at and we went back and forth and we argued about it and all of us are experts in these particular areas, okay? What I know about guidelines like this from societies is they're all done that way. And so I figure if I see a guideline for how to approach subdural hematoma, for example. I'm gonna pay attention to it because I know that the guys that developed it are experts and spent a lot of time and worked really hard to get me the correct information out the other side. So guidelines will all say, as this one does, these are only guidelines. You should use your own judgment about whether to use them or not, but I will say that you gotta think twice about not using a set of guidelines when they've been produced by a group like this. So, 
Case in point, uh, third international consensus definitions for sepsis and septic shock, and I bet you've all seen them and you've all looked at them, and you all know that that's where this definition came from. Great definition, I still say it. It's a great definition. Our previous diagnostic criteria for sepsis, severe sepsis and septic shock, exactly were aimed at this. They just didn't say it as succinctly or as well. I think this is a great definition. However, our diagnostic criteria dropped the term severe sepsis, dropped the use of SIRS and infection plus SIRS. So that sepsis now means an infection plus a change in SOFA score of at least two. Okay, um, severe sepsis according to their schema would be non-existent and septic shock instead of just unresponsive hypotension now means hypotension plus a lactate that's at least two. And now there are a lot of arguments. I just, I just submitted a, uh, a paper on this last week as a matter of fact and there are probably 20, at least 20 different editorials suggesting why this was not a good idea. Here's one of the reasons it's not a good idea. This is a sofa scale, okay? A buck to anybody who can tell me all these things on the sofa scale, you got them memorized already, right? Because it came out February of 2016, you ought to have this memorized, right? Yeah, that's not gonna happen. We are never going to memorize a table like this and use that as our diagnostic criteria very well. And they even knew that when they produced the guidelines. By the way, bottom line on the table here is Glasgow Coma Scale. So just to figure out the Glasgow Coma Scale, you gotta have this table memorized. And even though I look at GCS every day in patients, I actually trust my nurses who are very good at it, who do it every shift, and they've been taught how, and they do it. And so I just read what they say the GCS is. If I have a question, we talk about it. But um, but, so I don't even have this memorized, much less the full SOFA scale. That is a problem with it. They recognized that, they gave us quick SOFA, also known as QSOFA. So if you meet any two of these three things, they say uh, you're high risk of sepsis. So what are those things? Altered mental status, <laughs> respiratory rate more than 22, and a systolic blood pressure less than 100. So basically, if you meet any of these two things, you pretty much already have what we've called severe sepsis for the last 25 years. Um, and you are approaching, as a matter of fact, there are multiple combinations here that would give you uh, two or more SOFA points. So you pretty much meet it with this. And they suggest that this should be our rapid screening tool. Now there are a lot of problems with that. So people who've tried to adopt this early have bumped into these problems. The end point for a diagnostic tool. A diagnostic tool, what they said is we want this diagnostic tool to predict mortality or at least a prolonged ICU stay. Meaning we don't want to pick up people who aren't quite as sick, we only want them when they're sick enough that they're damn near guaranteed to go to the ICU or to die. Which is kind of goofy given that we know that early intervention makes a difference. This thing hasn't been tested for its ability to improve outcome. If we start using QSOFA now, what do we know about whether we will save lives or not save lives? We don't. And we shouldn't adopt it until we know something about that. SOFA itself is a severity of illness scale. Patients meet QSOFA criteria late in their course. In fact, there is subsequent data that shows this. QSOFA will be met about five hours before ICU transfer or death. SIRS criteria will be met about 17, median, a median of 17 hours before ICU transfer or death. So essentially what we've done is swap sensitivity for specificity, which is perhaps not wise when we're using, looking for a screening tool. And then as I said, it's not been adopted by CMS. Here's a little table and you've all got handouts so you can look at this I hope. Uh, this is a little thing that I did where I looked at sensitivity and specificity of 
of uh, SIRS, infection with SIRS, infection with Q-SOFA, NUS, MUSE, and severe sepsis. And what I found was that in the biggest, actually the funny thing about this, this Calconan article was published as a criticism of SIRS. And they went, well look, 12% of people with organ dysfunction induced by infection don't have SIRS. So it must be terrible. Um, and in their own study, what they demonstrated was that severe sepsis criteria are 92% sensitive and 84% specific, which beats out the new criteria by a country mile. So I think this is up in the air. This would be an instance if you are beginning to say, or if you're beginning to hear, well this guy, yeah he's got SIRS but he doesn't have Q-SOFA so we're not going to move on him. If you've heard anything like that, this would be an instance of adopting too early before there's actually adequate data to support it. What other kind of bottlenecks can exist? So let's say we learn how to diagnose, but now we've made a diagnosis and we need to initiate treatment, okay? All the same five types of provider error exist, okay? So I'm not gonna run through them again. Um, I just wanna point out some of the important places where those provider errors inhibit us. One is in the administration of early antibiotics, or early administration of antibiotics. So this is data from my friend Anand Kumar, um, who showed that the time you give antibiotics after the onset of septic shock makes a difference to survival. This is time across the bottom. This is survival fraction here. What you should know is that historically the best survival people got was somewhere between uh, 40 and 50 percent for septic shock. And what Anand and his colleagues showed is that if you get antibiotics within a half hour, your survival is 83 percent. Every hour that goes by, subsequently, your mortality goes up by seven and a half or your survival goes down by seven and a half percent. And furthermore, what they showed, which was really kind of sad, is that the median time to get antibiotics was six hours, which puts people at above a 50 percent mortality. So we know that providers, the funny thing that I've always found ironic about this, these were 14 ICUs where they cared about septic shock, interested in studying septic shock, want to know if giving antibiotics faster improves survival, and yet their median time to give antibiotics was six hours. So, so I guess what I'm saying is there are bottlenecks. That's the point. Uh, here's a little more data that I decided to toss in just for fun. This is some of our own data from KU. Uh, what we did was look at 3,900 people who came to the ER with severe sepsis at the time of presentation. We looked at multiple factors that might predict their progression to septic shock after they hit our doors. The one that stood out the most was antibiotic timing. And what we found was that 8% more would go into septic shock per hour of delay in antibiotics. So it's not just septic shock where hours of delay make a difference. Any level of sepsis, hours of delay make a difference. So 8% incidence of going into septic shock and the mortality was up by 5% per hour for every delay. So that's important stuff. Also, early goal-directed therapy. Actually, you know, I don't have to say too much. You guys are all aware of these studies that claim to debunk early goal-directed therapy. This would be a case where docs are jumping on the bandwagon to dump it because they don't like it. In point of fact, those studies left us with some important questions that they were incapable of answering. Um, the reason why is half the people in those studies had met the goals of treatment by the time they were enrolled in the study. But they were left in the study and still studied. They had to be. Um, 
Well, for, for methodologic reasons, but the important point is we don't know. Is it important if you have a low central venous O2 saturation? Because they didn't study that. They also didn't study what's the difference if you have a low central venous O2 saturation, should we treat it or not? And if you have a low central venous O2 saturation, is it important to take an organized approach to that? Those are left unanswered which is why the surviving sepsis guidelines still, still uh, we argued a lot about this, should we leave in our components that looked like early goal-directed therapy or not. In the end, we voted for, we can't tell folks they have to use it in everyone that meets criteria, and the reason why is people are doing, a lot of folks are doing a really good job of the early bundle. Okay. So we talked about when clowns go bad, how about when potato salad goes bad? What am I talking about potato salad? I'm talking about the healthcare system. Okay, there are bottlenecks that exist because of administration and the support we get from administration. Any administrators in here? Any hospital executives? Yes, okay. Fortunately, a hospital executive who's also a doc, so that always helps in my mind. Any others here? Did I just embarrass you and make you not want to raise your hand? Sorry about that. So uh, here's a concept that we have to get through our heads. You know, see these things here? Anybody know what these things are? Yeah, these are NFL football teams. These are the logos of a bunch of NFL football teams. So anybody know who won the Super Bowl last year? Patriots. Patriots? Patriots won the Super Bowl. How do you know that? Watch the game. He watched the game. Okay. <laughs> I would posit that there's a slightly different reason. Because when you watch the game, what you saw in the end was this. 34 to 28. How would you have known who won the game if there wasn't that thing that every time you cross a goal line, you get six points. Every time you kick it through the uprights, you get one or three points. Okay? They kept score. They kept track. Because if they didn't keep track, there'd be room for argument, right? Now, this is a cool thing. If you go to the NFL website, you can find the score and the stats on every NFL game that's ever been played. They actually store them out there, and you can look at them if you want. Why do they do that? They think it's important to keep statistics. They think it's important to keep score. How did we even know that New England deserved to be in the Super Bowl because they kept score in every single game, right? And they kept track of how many games they won and they also kept track of our beloved Kansas City Chiefs, which is why this time we made the playoffs. You know how many years I've been showing a slide similar to this and had to say, well, the Chiefs didn't even get in the playoffs. Well, at least we did last year. That's worth something, but didn't quite make it. So, let me ask you this. Today's Wednesday. The Chiefs are up there near Arrowhead and they're wearing pads and they're hitting each other and they're throwing the football around and they're tackling each other but they're not keeping score. So what do we call that? Practice. practice. Some of you have heard this before. You call it practice and that's why I have this to say. If you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. In any hospital, in any place, in any practice, if you're not keeping score of the things that are important, you're just practicing. Now, I do find some irony in the fact that we've always called the doing of medicine practice. So <laughs> practicing medicine doesn't sound too terribly bad when you put it in that light. But I think you get the point I'm trying to make. So the responsibility of the system and where the bottleneck frequently occurs here is in the provision of personnel to track the data for us. This is very often difficult for us to shake out as a system. And I sometimes chide our CEO on how many people work in the accounting department and how many people work in the quality improvement department. You know, the accounting makes sure every penny is accounted for. Quality improvement to actually demonstrate that we are doing what we say we're there to do substantially fewer people, and it's harder to come by. This is a bottleneck. Feedback. Residents, are you all getting feedback on your performance? Yes, 
every rotation, someone sits down with you and gives you feedback about what you did well, what you could do better, and what you want to do to make that happen. I hope, because that's what we're all supposed to be doing. Feedback is important. We don't improve unless we know where our deficiencies are. Feedback has to be specific. It's got to be timely. It's of no use to sit down six months after you did a rotation with me in the ICU and have me tell you, well, you were kind of sloppy back then. That means nothing to you now. And it needs to be objective, by which I mean not pejorative. It just needs to be objective. So I want to give you an example of our feedback at University of Kansas Hospital. So every sepsis patient that comes through the emergency department who has a sepsis response activated, and we do have a sepsis response team that goes down for the purpose of providing additional hands to get all the jobs done. Not to diagnose, not to move ER docs out of the way or ER nurses, but to be there for additional help so that we get things moving. Every single patient gets an email from Dustin Pierce, our sepsis coordinator, and me, the chair of our sepsis uh, quality improvement team. And it starts like this. This is a summary of the essential elements. Please note it's updated continuously to reflect the new indications. Scorecards, a tool for discussion. You're not mandatory. You don't have to complete these. Um, but we just want you to take a look at the information. So what does the information say? Nothing but facts, ma'am. Oops, let's go. So here's what we are. We have patient's uh, initials, sometimes a medical record number. We have when the sepsis response team was activated, when the patient showed up. We have specific doctors and nurses who were involved in the patient's care, and this goes to every single doctor and nurse <coughs> that was involved in the patient's early care. Okay? And all it says is this. What time was time, or I think we listed time zero here, 16.02. What time did you get the rapid lactate drawn? 16.17, that was at 15 minutes. Hey, good job. Our goal is in less than an hour at KU. Follow up or trending lactate was done when? At 59 minutes, after a fluid bolus. Two blood cultures drawn, done here. Broad spectrum antibiotics, done here. You get the picture. All the components of the sepsis bundle just listed. And it doesn't say it's not highlighted in red. It's not highlighted in yellow. It is not pejorative. It is just simply objective fact. And this patient turned out not to have shock. But if they do have shock, all of the rest of the six hour bundle are included. This goes to every care team for every patient with sepsis. And, pardon me, the interesting thing is we started this two years ago and we see steady improvement in this without doing anything else. Feedback. If you have feedback, you go, oh, and if it comes in a timely fashion, this is to you within five days of the time the patient presented. You remember who the patient was. You remember what the circumstance was. You look at your numbers and you go, damn, I thought we got that lactate done sooner. And it gives you food for proceeding with your quality improvement. So the responsibility of the system is to provide us with adequate feedback. They collect the data, collect it quickly, get us feedback. Last but not least, tools to do our job. This is one that's promoted by Surviving Sepsis Campaign. You can go to survivingsepsis.org. I just did it this morning, downloaded it and put it on this slide. Um, evaluation for severe sepsis screening tool. We did a collaborative and surviving sepsis campaign. Oops, I've slowed down more than I thought. I'm gonna speed up here so that we've got a few minutes for questions. We did a collaborative in the surviving sepsis campaign looking for sepsis on the hospital wards, east coast, 
middle of the country, west coast. I chaired the middle of the country component. We had a mantra for screening our patients. And the mantra said this, every patient, every shift, every day. We had everyone use a tool like that one, or like this one. This is the one that we used at KU, formerly used before the EMR. Um, and so we screen every patient, every shift, every day. We find sepsis when it's young and we treat it. One caveat about electronic screening, which I think is a great idea. Have you guys tried it here yet? Not necessarily. So electronic screening is a great idea. This is a study we published about our early experience with it, which is this, that, and just so you can see, we built this tool with this algorithm and you can look at that on your, on your handouts later. I'm not gonna walk through it, but it looks for what you might think but we had a problem with it. It captured every single person with SIRS and it never knew whether they were infected or not. And it's really hard for an early detection tool to know that. As you might imagine, um, even though it can find SIRS instantly, as soon as the nurse enters the vital signs, bam, it'll say SIRS. As soon as there's any labs present, it'll go bam, there's organ dysfunction. But who's the last person to write in the chart? and put the vital piece of information about an infection, it's the doc or the nurse. Our documentation of that thing is hard. Because we type pneumonia, suspected pneumonia. If we're good, we fill out our problem list and we put pneumonia on the problem list and then it instantly finds it. But we don't do that until hours after the fact. So it turns out it's a great screening tool for nothing, also a great screening tool for sepsis, but it can't tell the difference between which is which. So you gotta be careful about that when you're gonna use an electronic screening tool. How about this, sepsis order sets. These are the hardest thing to get folks to use, especially in the emergency room. Now you can see, I'm, I'm happy that I picked this particular one. This is the emergency department sepsis order set. And I can tell you our issue with what makes it hard to get emergency department doctors to use it is the order set includes send a lactate, send the blood culture, send this and that. And our ER doctors tell us we've already done that stuff. That's how we arrived at the diagnosis of sepsis to begin with. We got back the lactate of four. Um, so that's already done, don't have it on the order set, you're wasting time, you're wasting effort, we're just not gonna do that, okay? Which is why we adapted for the ED and made one that does not have those pre-selected um, so that our ED docs would use it more frequently. Interestingly enough, just like you might imagine, our resident ED physicians use it a lot more frequently than our attending ED physicians if the attendings are over about age 45. So <laughs> just go figure, okay? However, tools like this are important for the system to provide. I just tossed this in. This is a tool that's freely available from the Kansas Sepsis Project for screening, tracking, and reporting your performance on these bundles. Um, so the system doesn't even have to buy anything if they wanted to use something like this. And th this isn't the only one. So the system needs to provide decision support and implementation tools. Those are the bottlenecks that the system can take care of for us. Last thing I wanna talk about is process mapping. And doggone it, I didn't leave myself as much time as I'd hoped for this. If you map your processes, if you stop and think every single thing you do in your life is a process, and you back up, Getting up out of bed in the morning is a process. It perhaps begins with reaching to slam the alarm off. 
rolling over a couple of times, finally groaning, putting your left foot out of the bed, standing up, walking to the bathroom. There are multiple steps involved in this, and this is what mapping processes is, is about. And if you map your processes, you can increase how well you understand what it is that you're doing now. You can understand where the thing is going off the rails. Where is it that we're goofing up? <clears throat> you can teach other people how to do the process you want. If everyone understands the process, we're all talking the same language. You can document the process and you can plan improvement. Here's a trivial one here, making pasta. This is off of a, a website. I thought this is good because people then maybe can understand. You're going to make pasta, what are you going to do? Fill a pan with water, put the pan on the stove, turn on the stove, decide whether the water is boiling or not. If not, you wait for it to boil. If yes, you add the pasta. Is the pasta ready? No. Wait for it to cook. If it is, yes, drain it and then you eat it. Okay, now you can break any one of these things down into even more steps if you need to cut it finer. Filling a pan with water. Get the pan out of the cabinet. Carry it to the sink. Turn the water on. Hot water or cold water. You can get as fine as you need to, but the key thing is you want to understand your process. So I just made this one up this morning. Okay, and I can even see flaws in it uh, already. So a patient arrives at our emergency room. Here's a question, do they come by EMS? If yes, they go straight into an ER bed where we attach them to a monitor and we take the vital signs. If no, they go to the triage nurse. Triage nurse takes the vital signs. Is SIRS present? If yes, do they have a history of infection, etc. If SIRS no, check an alternate history. Don't go down the same pathway. Okay, and of course this goes on and on from there. And I immediately saw how if I had designed a system like this and this is the way the system works, then we got a little bit of a problem because actually the question of SIRS should come in a different way from the triage nurse than it does from the nurse at the bedside and should probably take you down a different pathway. By mapping that process out, I put it on the page and I went, that's a mistake. Am I going to fix that? No. That's a good way to illustrate what process mapping does for you. If you understand the processes, you can understand where they're going wrong and how to fix them. So, the last choke point for the system is that the system needs to be the facilitator of your team. It's it's what you need of your healthcare system, your hospital, that they make time for docs, nurses, RTs, pharmacists, always executives. No point in all of these folks making a decision because they're the ones that control whether it can happen or not. But the system has to facilitate this. So, my summary of all this, and I took yeah, it took 55 minutes when I intended 45. But improving performance and outcomes requires knowledge of your weaknesses and your bottlenecks. It requires commitment to change, which I think you guys have, which is cool. Um, and I don't have to give you a rah-rah, sepsis is great talk, or sepsis is horrible talk. You've got that has to be informed by the medical evidence and by your own local data that's given in timely, effective feedback. And it takes cooperation from you guys and the executives that run this joint. And that's how we improve our compliance measures and the care that we're giving to our sepsis patients. That's what I got. Sorry, I didn't leave you any time for questions. I'm out of here. See ya. <laughs> No, I'm glad to take questions, and I've got all afternoon. See, no one's clapping at the end. I told you. I told you. <laughs> They're stunned. Yes, sir. Uh, you point out the importance of giving timely antibiotics. Yes. How important is that to give the right antibiotics? <clears throat> it is correct, and it's so correct that that's why we choose broad-spectrum antibiotics. 
Um, and the survival has been demonstrated to be better with broad spectrum than with any attempts to focus your antibiotics at that part of treatment. Um, because if you focus and you focused wrong, your patient's done for. Okay? So this is the time we use broad spectrum antibiotics. And this fits well with antibiotic stewardship, I want to say. With the antibiotic stewardship, what do we do? We narrow as soon as we can. We don't treat people with trivial viral infections with antibiotics. We don't use antibiotics when they're not necessary. And why do we do that? And why can I say this? Because this is the person that we're trying to save antibiotics for. All right? Life-threatening organ dysfunction, this is the person who needs our antibiotics, and this is who we are doing antibiotic stewardship for. Those two things are not like this. They are like this. And uh, so that's the, way, that's the way we view them. Yes, sir. I heard on an infectious disease podcast yesterday that um, there's a study out that suggests that we're so focused on the first dose of antibiotics that we're missing on the second dose of antibiotics. <laughs> That's interesting. I have not seen that data. Just to repeat for you guys, uh, there was an ID podcast yesterday with a study. I'd love to, uh, to see it. Do you even remember what uh, journal it came from or anything? No. Study showing we're so focused on our first dose of antibiotics that we may be forgetting what happens with our second one. Wouldn't shock me. That would not shock me. Um, and. Uh, um, so I'm not sure what to say about that except for I'm going to go back and look at our data on the second antibiotic dose because I think that's, that's equally as important. Um, yeah, here's a, I, I want to illustrate this for you just because this just popped into my head. patient we got had a um, um, uh, laparoscopic coli uh, and was in rehab. They wanted to watch him, not just send him home to have him take care of his own wound. Um, he becomes obtunded in rehab, gets admitted, um, is still obtunded because of his previous neurological issues. The focus is on neurology, does not have SIRS, um, and then goes into shock, gets moved to another ICU um, where they can't figure out the shock. They call us, we bring him over and look at his post-intubation x-ray and he clearly has an aspiration pneumonia on his post-intubation x-ray. So we get antibiotics within two hours of when he hit our, ER, uh, hit our uh, ICU. He was in four-pressor shock. He was in two-pressor shock when he came to us, progressed to four-pressors. And but in about 48 hours, we had him down to to nothing, but illustrates the importance of, of a lot of things, of awareness, you know, just because you don't have SIRS doesn't mean you don't have sepsis, understanding what's going on. Our s initial focus was belly because he just had an abdominal surgery, right? Um, and and uh, illustrates also, though, that when you get the right antibiotic, it does a job. It is still important. Source control is absolutely key. Mm. So uh, currently the debate in sepsis seems to be that uh, SIRS is too sensitive and QSOFA is way too specific. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on where do we go from here? Yeah, so, so that comment was a really good comment, which I agree with. Um, the reason for this whole QSOFA business is because it was believed that SIRS is too sensitive. Okay? QSOFA is overly specific at the expense of sensitivity. That's what I just told you, so where do we go from here? So there are two or three points that I like to make, and it's why I kind of stopped during the talk to, to illustrate this, is this is the typical intern's error or intern's mistake. And not just interns, plenty of people make this. They get the call from the nurse at night, Mr. Smith just spiked a temp to 104. Um, and so, and so the thought process goes, oh gee, okay, his temp's 104, he's a little tachycardic, he's got SIRS, so I have to suspect infection. Now, oh, now I'm suspecting infection, and I have suspected infection and SIRS, so, so I have 
sepsis. Well, that's a, that's a mistake, and that's why I said what suspected infection actually is. So stop and think about this. My friend Jean-Louis Vincent um, from Brussels, he always, and he, he's very flamboyant, if you've ever seen him at a conference, and he says things like, ha, sir is so nonspecific, I make love to my wife, I get sirs. <laughs> and he goes, Hopefully more than once. <laughs> and, that's, and, and I agree with that, I agree with that. So what makes sirs nonspecific is when we consider it like that. Now. Let me propose something else to you. And, and I usually say, I don't say making love to my wife, I say climbing a flight of stairs. Same piece of information. Okay, now what he's forgetting is something called Bayes' theorem. Remember what Bayes' theorem says is that the likelihood that you've got a disease after you've seen a positive test depends on number one, how likely is that test to be positive in the disease you're looking at, but number two, actually really number one, how common is how common is the disease in the population you're looking at. So let me pose two people for you. One is me climbing three flights of stairs and then going <laughs> at the top versus a patient who's not doing anything except lying in bed with a cellulitis who has a pulse rate of 110 and a respiratory rate of 23 and a temperature of 38.6, okay? So the likelihood of sepsis in me is so minuscule that you should discount my SIRS for purposes of diagnosing sepsis. The likelihood of SIRS being caused by that infection there is quite high. And that's why I pay attention to what is the infection syndrome that's making you consider this SIRS and think about sepsis. So that's one thing. Second thing, in the article I just submitted, I said this. The appropriate use of SIRS is that when it's present, it should prompt you to A, look for infection, which might be its cause, and B, look for organ dysfunction, which might be its companion. That's the appropriate use. If we use SIRS as our criteria for sepsis, we are mistaken. If we use an infection that I can clearly see is an infection causing SIRS. Remember, the difference that SIRS does for us is it takes the abscess on my hand. Oh yeah, I got this last, uh, last summer. Took my parents to visit my aunt. She had me open. I had never seen this before. It was corned beef in a can. And I went, she wanted to make corned beef Sandwiches, okay, fine. So you, have you ever seen those cans with a little key that you open? I hadn't seen one in like 30 years, but she had me open it up. I cut myself and I was bleeding all over everywhere. And I was too big of a wuss to rinse it with alcohol, so I kind of rinsed it with water and then put a bandage on it. And I got a big red splotch over the course of two or three days. And I was starting to get a little bit worried about it. But you know what I never got? I never got fever. I never got tachycardia, I never got tachypnea, um, because the difference would be that this infection stayed localized and then shrank back down. And the other things are signs that the infection is causing systemic, body-wide response. <clears throat> that clearly is something worse than having a red splotch. Now, had it started climbing up my arm any further than that, I probably would have jumped on the antibiotics immediately. Um, but that's the point I'm trying to make. SIRS means there's something worse than a simple infection. Organ dysfunction means there's something worse than just system-wide signs. And so how should we go? I think how we should go is the proper use of infection and SIRS, and I think that would inform our decision making much better than abandoning for something else. Now, as you know, because you mentioned this before and I showed on the slide, there are a couple of other tools that people use. The National Early Warning System, which they use in Britain as a general predictor of badness. 
Um, and it's a very good one, very accurate. Um, and then there's the modified early warning system that a lot of uh, EMS, EMRs have in them, like uh, uh, I think Cerner does, pretty sure Cerner does, um, maybe Meditech does, uh, if you choose to use it, um, which are just identifiers of people on the floor that look like they might go bad, general general. So it's not a surprise that those would also predict infected people who look like they might go bad. And that might be something that we wind up at. Just remains to be seen. There's a lot of politics. I hate to say that. There's a lot of politics in what definitions do we adopt. And the politics, all 19 people on that, most of them were middle-aged men. There were no women. There was nobody from an emerging nation. Uh, where they don't have the same kind of money that we do in Western Europe and the United States. Um, they were all intensivists at places like KU and even more esoteric. So, so there, there's a lot of skew in their viewpoint. Um, and so there is, there is a call. I, and so I can tell you a whole bunch of people who didn't endorse those guidelines. American College of Chess Physicians, um, American College of Emergency Physicians, American College of Surgeons, American Academy of Family Medicine, uh, the American College of Physicians, for heaven's sakes, the journal it was published in, the Journal of the American Medical Association, wasn't endorsed by the AMA. So, except I guess if you figure that being in the journal is an endorsement, I don't know. Um, so, so there are a whole lot of people that hold different opinions about that. Um, but the interesting thing is that the two top critical care journals in the world critical care medicine and intensive care medicine are the two societies that sponsored the conference. So you can imagine those journals are pushing the new definition. So, uh, so I don't know what we do, but I would say remember those careful guidelines about using SIRS and looking for infection as the cause of SIRS. And I think that helps you not to make that oversensitivity mistake. Very long-winded, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome.